Every week, we're proud to bring you great guests from the world of business, economics, as well as the financial media. But we also like to welcome experts who do exactly what we do, that is help everyday Americans and businesses protect and manage their money. Now, some might refer to them as competitors, but we see them as colleagues with a common objective. And if we think that they can bring unique insights that help us educate you, our income generation viewers, then yes, we're absolutely positively glad to have them here on the show. And that's why we'll be sitting down today with a wealth advisor from United Capital Financial Advisors, a national financial firm with a unique service, and that is managing the mega wealth of professional athletes. So the question becomes, can everyday investors really learn valuable lessons from the common financial missteps of mega stars and sports? Well, you better believe you can. It's time to tune out the hype and focus on the facts. Facts that matter to you, the income generation. Let's get started. Get ready to separate reality from myth. With us, David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. But David Scranton says, hey, not so fast. How does it affect the market? How does it affect the economy? Thanks to efficiencies in new technology and a staff of veteran analysts and portfolio managers, sound income strategy strives to set new standards and bring institutional style investing to your portfolio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. Now, it's, it's no secret that professional athletes at the highest levels of their profession are often paid very, very well. While the majority do handle their finances well enough to enjoy long, comfortable retirements, others do get into well-publicized trouble. They end up losing tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars. Sometimes they lose absolutely everything. And most of us probably have the same reaction to those sad stories. We ask, how could this possibly happen? And we feel confident that it can never happen to us, but in reality, many of the same mistakes that lead to financial catastrophe for some professional athletes are also made by everyday investors. We're gonna talk about some of those mistakes and other potential pitfalls on today's show and about how you can avoid them. Joining us today is Adam Vega of United Capital Financial Advisors, a national organization with four offices right here in Boca Raton, Florida. Among other services, United Capital specializes in investment services, including those for financial or for professional athletes, I should say. We'll also talk with other financial advisors in the field at our Financial Advisors Roundtable. Yes, America loves our sports, and star athletes can quickly become larger than life figures. But the truth is that many come from very typical, often very humble backgrounds. They're the sons and daughters of working or middle class families, oftentimes families who've sacrificed a lot to keep their young athlete on the right path to the big leagues. So when it comes to managing their newfound wealth, let's face it, most athletes, like most people in general, don't come to the task with much or in some cases any experience. Most are probably quick to realize this and they wisely take advantage of resources available to them to help them plan for their financial future. And yet the statistics when it comes to athletes who run into financial problems can be quite troubling. In fact, according to a 2009 Sports Illustrated article, 78% of former NFL players face bankruptcy or financial stress within two years of retirement. The same article reported that the rate of NBA retirees who go broke within five years of leaving the game was as high as 60%. Now those figures are especially troubling when you consider the massive multi-million dollar salaries that are paid to many professional athletes. It's a situation that illustrates one hard financial truth that applies to everyone, not just athletes. And that is the key to financial security isn't the size of your nest egg. It's all about how you manage it. It's about how well you strategize, how well you work with your financial coach. In fact, there's an analogy I often use to illustrate this point that comes from the world of sports. There comes a point in many professional sports games where one coach realizes that his team has put up enough points to win. At that point, the coach is likely to shift his strategy and focus mainly on protecting that lead. Now, he's not gonna totally abandon his offensive efforts, but he'll make a decision that defense is a priority at that point. In fact, as one great coach, Vince Lombardi, once put it, offense wins games, defense wins championships. Now, consider this. Three-time NBA All-Star Antoine Walker earned over $108 million during his 13-year career. By any objective measure, most people would probably agree that $108 million is most likely enough to retire comfortably on. 
In other words, it's enough points to win the game. But unfortunately, Walker ended up filing for Chapter 7 bankruptcy in 2010, and his story was the subject of a 2015 documentary called Gone in an Instant. In cases like Antoine Walker's, one of the common storylines you see has to do with athletes who weren't active enough in their own financial planning. While they may have wisely taken advantage of resources available to them rather than trying to manage their own wealth with zero experience, they unwisely put blind faith into those resources. And this is another mistake just as common among everyday investors. It's not about the size of your nest egg, but how well you strategize and work with your financial coach, provided that you have one. But it's also imperative that you find the right coach and you take an active role in working with him or her. And if he or she is indeed the right coach, that person will insist that you do so. You see, like I always say, no coach can actually play the game for you, but a good coach would never claim that he could. Only you know the goals that you hope to achieve. Only you know about new goals and personal challenges that might arise. A good financial coach will recognize all of that. He'll have the right set of values and he'll want to work with you, not for you. And with a coach like that, you'll stand a much better chance of avoiding a common mistake that can drain even the mega wealth of a star athlete, and that is being too disengaged from the investment process. So what are some other parallels and lessons we can learn from the lucrative world of sports? Well, now it's time to ask a true expert. Joining us today is Adam Vega of United Capital Financial Advisors, a national firm with four offices right here in Boca Raton, Florida. Among other services, United Capital specializes in investment services and business services for executives and high net worth individuals, including, yes, our topic today, professional athletes. Welcome to the show, first of all. Now, it's interesting because in working heavily with professional athletes, you know, you must find that there are two or three unique concerns that apply to professional athletes that don't apply to, to others. Can you speak to us for a moment about those concerns? Sure, Dave. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. The biggest hurdle that we see happen across with most of our young athletes, in this case, coming into a lot of wealth very quickly, right? And oftentimes, the amount of wealth that we find them coming into is oftentimes the, the amount of wealth that often takes a lifetime for someone to achieve. So you have someone who's young, coming into from nothing to something, and that this something is, is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, when, you, when we, you know, we fast forward and look at someone who's getting to those retirement years, they've had a lifetime of training of what to do, what works, what doesn't work. They've also adjusted spending habits very, very so often. And when you have an athlete who comes into, you know, in your example here, over 12 years, $108 million, that's very quickly to amass a wealth, to very quickly have that faucet turn off. So now we're, we're, we're forced to, or he's forced to adjust his level of lifestyle from this hundred or you know ten million dollars a year, whatever he was accustomed to, to now the faucet turns off. What do you do now? Mm -hmm. So while others would have this this lifetime to adjust and understand, make those mistakes, you have someone who very quickly is forced to make those mistakes. Well, but that's not true. I mean, all fairness to the athlete, you have to think about it, right? I mean, you know, if 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 the person's last year in the career, let's say they make uh, twenty million dollars then you only need about a half billion dollars to consistently generate 20 million of income. So all you got to do is turn that 108 into 500 million and you're good to go. That's easy, right? Uh, yeah, guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, FDIC insured. <laughs> but, but no, in all seriousness, you know, I guess, I guess the, 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 one of the questions I have for you then is, you know, what, how many of your clients are you fortunate enough to get early on in their careers, their first or second year, versus how many of them come to you later in their career after somebody else has done a bad job for them and now you have to pick up the pieces? Yeah, unfortunately, I would say this is the biggest issue we run into is that oftentimes when we're being introduced, it's oftentimes mid-career or in, in this example, this post-career, which you, know, you hear that classic uh, quote, we don't mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, plan to fail, we fail to plan. And unfortunately, it takes too long to come up with these or, or to realize that you're failing, right? And, and mm -hmm. I'm saying you're failing, that you're going to you know, ultimately run out of money. That's not always the case, but you start to understand that things aren't going the same way you thought they were going mm -hmm. to. And, and very oftentimes, you have these huge spreads, which, which is really another issue that you run into, I feel. You have you know, your extremes, your LeBron James mm -hmm. of the world making, who, who knows what he's making these days versus your every other rookie who's making you know not even a quarter of what he's earning. Sure. So you're, you're seeing this lifestyle of what it could be and it, it, it trickles down to you and you, you start getting used to that same kind of spending habits of living like almost beyond you, you know, you're buying your means 
just because you're you're in that environment, getting exposed yeah. to it. So even you, as a financial professional, sometimes have to keep yourself in check and say, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not LeBron," you know, that kind of thing. Exactly. So, so if you do, if you are fortunate enough to get somebody early on in their career, um, you know, how do you try to coach them to put some money away, not to spend it all right now? Uh, and save some money for the future. Are there rules of thumb as to how much you tell them to put away or, or just talk to us about that? Sure, uh, well I say immediately on the front end, we understand that there's, there's gonna be new spending that we, whether we wanna plan for, we do our best to plan for, it's gonna happen no matter what. So we automatically will give someone a spending budget. And mm -hmm. we say, you know, what are these things you absolutely wanna have? And let's figure out what they're gonna cost. And can we back into leaving you that, that cushion to allow you to do those things you want? And accepting that it's just gonna happen. We then like to think of the next tier, you know, for that mid-level. So what can we do that's a little bit more intermediate? Mm -hmm. Can we store this money away somewhere else? And then more longer term is what can we plan for for that ultimate post-career? And the important thing here is training them to get used to this mindset of saving, right. setting money aside, and understanding. And you know, it, it's also it's a very foreign topic to oftentimes a lot of these guys, which they're not it's, used to saving. They're not like, used to investing. Well, it's like it's like how they became really good at their sport is it's all about practice and exactly. it's all about good habits and when you form good habits early on it makes it easy you form bad habits you get a mid-career now you really have your hands filled i'm sure exactly so if you had to say there was a rule of thumb you know that people should try to save if they start off their careers with a big income like a professional athlete you tell people if you had to give them a rule of thumb and i know it's all specific for the individual, yeah. is it 10, 20, 30, 40? What, what's the right percentage that makes you feel comfortable if you were forced to give people a rule of thumb? It, it, it's so hard to, to come up with a blanket number. I would say if we're thinking of money in terms of quarters to 25%, uh, if that's gonna be what you're gonna spend, let's stage the next 25% for something a little more intermediate. Let's stage the next 25% for something a little bit further out. And then the last 25% something a little bit even further out. And, and you know, it's, not, it's never gonna be cut and dry. We know this because everyone's circumstances are always gonna be so different. And especially when we're looking at athletes where we have these huge extremes of salary potential or right. earnings potential. Uh, we also, you know, f focusing on LeBron James again, it's anything he does in the rest of his life is gonna turn into money, right? He's mm -hmm. that household name. But we oftentimes don't have that happening with our younger, or our, our rookie. You know, he, he mm -hmm. can't just pick up and run with something else and be You can't monetize everything, right? Exactly, so that's, that's what we're always trying to get them thinking of and understanding is although we want to plan for everything to go you know, smooth sailing and perfectly, it's mm. probably not going to be the case. So we do like to do our best to plan for uh, a worst case scenario the best way that we can. Well, plus not everyone can have uh, Warren Buffett as their mentor as LeBron James famously has. So that's, that's, that's a distinct advantage. And that was one of the smartest decisions I think LeBron's ever made. We need to take a break right now. Uh, we'll be back with more words of wisdom with my new friend, Adam. So stay with us, we'll be right back to learn more about how you can learn from mistakes of professional athletes. We'll be right back. If you're not using someone who's well-trained in fixed income and you're born before 1966, it may just be time for you to break up with that advisor and move on. I would suggest someone who will care for you through these important years of your life. If you need help finding someone, call or write us. I'd also like to remind you of the special report entitled The Income Generation. This is available free to you, our loyal viewers, online. If you haven't downloaded your report, pick it up after the show. If you're near or in retirement, head over to theincomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those be born before 1966. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. A 2015 Money Magazine article about pro athletes who've suffered major financial losses included this, uh, this following fact. Statistically, basketball players who demonstrate a preference for long range, low percentage, three point shots seem especially likely to run into money problems after they retire. In other words, the players who are 
risk takers by nature are the ones more likely to suffer financial losses later on. Of course, all athletes are risk takers to a certain extent. They're also young and most of us are more apt to take risks in our youth than we are after age 40 or so, especially if you're part of the income generation after age 50. But not all basketball players consistently shoot for three-pointers. Not all quarterbacks regularly go for uh, the Hail Mary. Not every batter swings for the fences on every pitch. Some individuals, however, are simply wired to be risk takers, and that goes for doctors, lawyers, and plumbers as much as it does for professional athletes. In other words, it's another area where everyday investors can learn from the financial missteps of professional athletes. It's important to recognize whether you might have that trait yourself and understand that it could potentially pose a threat when it comes to financial planning. Natural risk takers tend to be gamblers by nature. As such, they may be inclined to gravitate toward investment options based largely on chance, more so than options that include elements of security and control. That may be okay up to a certain age, but again, after age 50, when you become part of the income generation, the stakes get much, much higher. And what a lot of people don't realize is that even common stocks in mutual funds are bigger gambles than most strategic, secure, income-based options. In fact, they can be huge gambles if they comprise the majority of your investments and you're within 15 years of retirement. With that, I'd like to welcome back Adam Vega of United Capital Financial Advisors. Adam, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for welcoming me back, Dave. So we're speaking about that tendency. Am I on the money that most athletes, in my mind, tend to be a little bit more aggressive uh, because they're, they are athletes and they're competitive and as a result they, they might tend to want to be a little bit more aggressive when it comes to their asset allocation? Yeah, I, I see it completely differently actually. I, I see most of the guys or most of the athletes that I'm exposed to being very more conservative in nature. And I do think that a lot of it has to do with a lot of the concepts we get into, especially with all these new fancy investments that are always coming about. They, they don't grasp how they they work oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? You know, a lot of these things we're, we're used to being exposed through through qualified plans, a 401k. A lot of these these guys just never got that exposure. We have coming out of high school, going into college, whatever the case is, sure. barely getting exposure to these financial instruments. So my experience is they're oftentimes mm -hmm. very conservative. You know, and that really shouldn't surprise me because if I think about it, a lot of Wall Street insiders, you know, the people you hear about that get these huge Wall Street bonuses for managing money, uh, a lot of them and their personal investments are very conservative. In fact, one of their favorite investments is the, is the municipal bond because they're in a high tax bracket, they want tax-free income, and because they want that security. They're taking so much risk in their careers, they don't want to take risk with their personal finances. Yeah. So I guess that leads us to another important thing we need to question here is that if the biggest risk that an athlete has seems to me is his health. Athletes may go into this hoping they have a a professional career of as long as 15 years or sometimes even longer, but they never know. An injury could happen tomorrow and boom, next thing you know, it's gone. How do you help athletes manage for that uncertainty? You know, in the investment world, it's all about time frame, time horizon. How long uh, you think before you'll need your money? And if you have an athlete coming in even at age 21 who doesn't know whether he's going to retire at 36 or be forced to retire at 25, how do you handle that uncertainty? Dave, I'd say the biggest thing is we all hope for the best, we want to plan for the worst, right? And okay. oftentimes I have sense. even my retiree clients who will say something like, my retirement plan is to work for the rest of my life, which in theory is a great idea unless something like that happens where you cannot work for the rest mm -hmm. of your life, which is the exact same instance with these athletes. Or in the case of a professional athlete where they're not the LeBron James type household name, where they've had a nice career, but maybe, maybe they can't monetize their name like a LeBron can. Yeah, very quickly they can get cut from the team, they can get yeah. hurt from the team, and that income, that spigot that they're so used to having, just be gone right away. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing, in my opinion, is getting that early start. We mentioned before, developing a plan as early as possible, trying to be on the front end of the unexpected, which you know, we just don't know what's to come. And we always want to stay, uh, we think of things in terms of uh, dials or controls, focus, focusing on what you can control. In this case, how much you're saving is something you can control. It's true. It's true. There's a lot that, especially in their careers, you know, the average person can get laid off at any time or yeah. get into trouble, but it's even more so with a professional athlete. So let me, let me put you on the spot for a minute if I can, right? as I love to do on the Income Generation Show. You know, I know every asset allocation is different for each client and for their goals. I get that. But you know, you get your average athlete, mid-20s, who is fairly conservative. They're telling you they're very conservative. And yet they, they want to, and you know that, gee, they could be forced into retirement tomorrow. What kind of asset allocation would you say 
as a general rule of thumb you'd recommend for that person in that situation who's still young, mid-20s by most traditional means, they should be in the stock market, but because of the uncertainty of the time horizon and the fact that they're conservative, how does that asset allocation change? Yeah, Dave, and, and I, I try to mention this before, but the importance of asset allocation is really where I was going, where mm. a lot of these guys, or a lot of these players, uh, you know, they say that they're conservative, but oftentimes when we look at what they're actually investing in, very, very, I'd say all the time, they're investing in things outside of the box, right? They're opening, they're investing in a restaurant, they're investing in a clothing company. That's right. Right, so all these things do get factored into an asset allocation. Those are some of those risky investments, but those are things they understand. So oftentimes we see that the things they don't really understand, your fixed income, your equity markets, but those let, are the things we see. But let's say you all fix that. all that, okay? You fix that and you get them down the basics with mm -hmm. your typical stock and bond type portfolio. And I'm in my mid-20s, I'm a professional athlete, right? I know I probably look more like I'm in my 30s than my mid-20s, but let's, let's, let's play with me for a while here. So I look, well thank you, you're very nice. <laughs> but I, so I'm in my mid-20s, a professional athlete, I say I'm conservative, you know that I might have 10, 12 more years left, I might not. You know, between a traditional stock and bond mixture, what kind of allocation would you typically recommend as a range for that uh, reported sur uh, conservative person? Yeah, I, I stick to balanced portfolios the best that I can. And it, again, it's hard to give a blanket recommendation with anyone because everyone's circumstances and situations are just so mm -hmm. vastly different. But in my opinion, balanced portfolios, when you're looking at you know, your traditional 60-40, uh, whatever that 40% comprises of today, whether it's fixed income, alternative investments, or whatever the case may be, my, my humble opinion is that's the best way to get exposure and learn investing. At that point, you can see how different asset classes perform. So again, this is for someone who's getting into the habit of saving. And 60-40 is pretty conservative for somebody in their 20s, Very for sure. Conservative. So how important is it that the, the athlete has a vision of what his or her retirement is gonna look like for you to be able to do the best job for that person? It's, it's so important, and, and we always think in terms of visualizing what you want, and let's figure out what it's gonna take in order for us to achieve you know, what that lifestyle it is that you, you envision. And what, 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 does, what do you wanna do once this spigot turns off? But how does the person you, know that in their 20s, though? They very few times do, and yeah. it's, that's one of the biggest hurdles is getting them to that mindset of this lifestyle will ultimately change one day, and let's think about what that plan B is. And we, we do try to get them to think of themselves as an image, their name as a, as a company, so we start getting them to think of that mindset. You know, how can we monetize your name? What can we do to create value so that ultimately you can get to that LeBron James status that we mm -hmm. uh, keep mentioning, right? So how can we get there? So in the minute or so we have left, if you could tell our income generation viewers, most of whom are over the age of 50, uh, you know, how they can learn from the mistakes of a lot of these pro athletes and things that they could do in their world to protect themselves so that they don't end up uh, being victimized to the same type of thing that happened to poor Antoine Walker. Yeah, I say one of the big things we, we recommend oftentimes is practice retirement. And whether it's an athlete, whether you're gonna practice one day what it looks like of not having that money, like it, plan, let's see if you can try this different lifestyle and live off of a certain asset level, a certain income level as an example. And uh, that's one, that's a big thing in my opinion is adjusting those spending habits and spending curves. The second is the asset allocation. It's so important to have money invested in multiple different places. As we know, there's an inverse relationship with most investments, right? Your stock portfolio goes up, your fixed income's going down. Sure, right? sure. It's so important to understand that relationship and having different pools of money invested in different places, performing differently to help provide you with more of a mm -hmm. consistent return throughout any market. And what you're telling me is something that athletes are totally accustomed to doing. Uh, even if you're a golfer, even if you're not a scratch golfer and you're a hacker like I am, you're always taught to visualize your shot before you make the shot. When a basketball player is, is, is making a free throw, he's visualizing the free throw before he makes it. All you're doing is asking him to take those skills of visualization and to, and to use them for visualizing his or her retirement, which I think is very, very good advice. So, Adam, thank you so much. I appreciate you being on the show today. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for having me. It's always nice making a new friend. So Likewise. Wonderful. All right. Coming up in just a bit, Miranda's going to break down some of today's most important financial deadlines. Stay tuned. You're watching The Income Generation. Read David J. Scranton's groundbreaking new book, Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad. Discover practical solutions to the financial challenges facing today's generation of retirees and near-retirees. 
Learn the truth about Wall Street, the financial media, and the secrets they try to hide from everyday investors. This isn't just another book about investing. Working Americans who have lived through two major stock market crashes and the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression in the past 16 years don't need another book about investing. David Scranton's approach to financial planning is a holistic system designed for maximum protection, strategic growth, and reliable income regardless of market conditions. Stop planning for retirement with your fingers crossed. Read Return on Principle, Seven Core Values to Help Protect Your Money in Good Times and Bad. Available now. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm Miranda Kahn. Now it's time for your Newsmax Finance Update, a quick wrap of the stories that move the market this week. Economics guru Larry Kudlow says tax reform is still possible this year, but only if the Trump administration can rally up support. What I'm told is they are working on a deal. I mean, the administration is talking to the House and the Senate. The Senate's a little bit behind on taxes, I'll grant you that. They're not going to get it done before the August recess. They will get health care done before the August recess. Can they get tax reform um, in the fourth quarter? I don't know. Kudlow says it's important for Republicans to show some positive economic results by the time the midterms roll around next year. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross says the administration is open to talks on a proposed trade agreement with the European Union. Ross told CNBC that although the Trump administration withdrew from its trade pact with Pacific nations, known as the TPP, it didn't back away from the proposed agreement with the EU. Luxury fashion retailer Michael Kors is forecasting a bleak year, saying it plans to shut more than 100 stores over the next two years. Shares of the company also slumped more than 10 percent. They're down to just under $33. That's their lowest level in more than five years. Walmart works to close the online gap between itself and Amazon. Walmart acquired Jet.com and other brands in an effort to appeal to younger shoppers. Plus, a retailer has adjusted its shipping strategy to better compete with Amazon Prime. For more on these stories, please visit Newsmax.com slash finance. I'm Miranda Khan. Now back to David Scranton and the Income Generation. All right, Miranda, thank you very much. Now, now that you're all up to date, let's hear from some other advisors in the field and get their insights on today's topic. Yes, it's time for another Financial Advisors Roundtable. And joining me today, we have Brad Williams, owner and president of Brad Williams Financial Services in Huntsville, Alabama. Brad has 30 years of experience in the business and focuses mainly on the needs of retirees, near retirees, and business owners. Brad, welcome back. It's great to be back, Dave. Also joining us again is Greg Milia, CEO of Milia Advisor Group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Greg's been in the business for 28 years using conservative income strategies to help clients near or in retirement with all of their financial needs. Greg, a big welcome back to you, too. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. You know, am I alone or do you run into clients like some of these professional athletes that we talked about with our previous guest, Adam Vega, who seem to be overconfident based upon the size of their portfolio, based upon their income or how much money they have in total? And if so, how do you address that? Greg? You, you, do, you do see that. People come in and they often don't underestimate they underestimate how much income they're actually gonna need over the long term. They're not really factored in inflation. They they still kinda of live in the mindset that maybe they're gonna be passing away at eighty, you know, and, and I'll tell you what, I'll never forget the time I had a lady, uh, she was a grandma, she came in at eighty two. She literally starts crying on me because she thought she had enough money in the early years, but as she told me, she said, Greg, I didn't expect to live into my eighties. In fact I'm completely healthy. I've got nothing wrong. She kinda of laughed at that point. Um, but she had underestimated the same thing. She didn't realize or recognize that, the, you know, she was crying because she was going to end up living in with, moving in with her son, and that was the last thing she mm. wanted to do was be dependent on her children. So, one, so, yeah, we do. So one element, Greg, of overconfidence is, yes, it's this propensity to think, well, I can spend down my money over 20, maybe even 25 years in retirement. Um, but even if someone is 65 and retires and wants to spend it down between 65 and 90, that's still a high risk today. So... How do you overcome that? How do you try to give a dose of reality while still being nice and respectful? 
Well, the funnest thing I like to do is the more fun things I like to do is ask them, do they remember the first time they bought their car? Would they pay for that car? You know, that was often 25, 30 years ago, and they laugh and they talk about two or three thousand dollars, and the average price today is thirty thousand. You can just look at the cost of food. I mean, give examples like that, and it really starts to sit home as to really how how much inflation does have an impact. It, I I call financial, you know, it's it's financial cancer. It's very slow, and it really mm. it eats away slowly. And you don't realize it until it's too late. You're in trouble. Yeah, it's insidious. It really is. So inflation is one thing that it's important to educate clients about. Brad, how about in your case? How do you overcome that when somebody has a sense of overconfidence? Well, I agree with Greg. I, I often use uh, cars and movie tickets as uh, as an example mm. of the difference in cost of living. And because people can identify with those two things, they they hit real close to home, so they can see, hey, look, I've got to adjust for uh, a longer lifespan. And and uh, I've been in the business you know, like you said, 30 years. And I'm seeing a lot of clients that first came to my seminars now hitting late 80s and, and early 90s. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's really hitting home that, that you have got to plan for longevity so, unless there's just issue in your family. So what do you personally remember as the lowest price that you can recall of movie tickets, Brad? A quarter. 25 <laughs> cents. Yeah, That's see, lovely. I guess I don't remember back that far. I must be a few years younger. Greg? You don't. You probably don't remember that either, do you, Greg? I don't remember being a quarter. That's that's really long. <laughs> no, actually, I do remember, Brad. I remember fifty cents uh, movie ticket. It was Mondays. Monday movies were were fifty yeah, cents. So it's that's a lot of inflation. But what do you say, Greg? What do you tell people uh, is is the most they should reasonably try to spend? So in other words, let's say somebody's got a million dollars. Let's pick a round number, and they're ready to retire. How do you explain to them how to determine how much of that they can take for income per year and they could comfortably spend without the risk of getting themselves in trouble? Well, that's a that's a loaded question. Um, there's a whole lot that goes into that that equation, um, not only just longevity, but how the assets are positioned. You know, what we see today is most people walked in their position for growth and not for income. Well, if let's assume position they're positioned for, for income. Let's say that you fix them, you've reorganized their finances, so their position for income. At that point, how much of that million dollars per year would you say they can comfortably take for income? Is a rule of thumb? Um, you know what I find out with somebody with a million dollars, I don't know if I have an exact one, because you know, not using, as you know, as any cookie cutter, cookie cutter processes, mm -hmm. we look at each income situation and, and define that we want to give them income now to live on. And usually in a million dollar case, they're not going to use all the income that we're going to be generating for them. So we're always going to be stacking some of the income for later, and we'll give them. I encourage people. There's, I think there's a couple things you have to look at too, and that's the fact during the. We like to define the time frame of retirement as not being just a set of time, but you know having the go-go mm -hmm. years initially when somebody's really active, and you want to be able to employ those assets and income during that time frame, and then as you know, then they enter the slow go. They make that pass. They go into the no go. And one of the offsets to inflation is the fact that you will do less in the slow go and the no go. But at the same time, you don't want to run out of money during that time frame. Okay. Well, long about way to answer your question is you, you, you want to stack some for the future. Okay. So, Brad, clearly, if I ever move to Oklahoma, uh, I'm going to vote for Greg as governor because he'd make the perfect politician, Brad. If you noticed, he didn't really answer my question. He kind of danced around it. So, Brad, help me out here. I know you don't personally, you love what you do so much, you don't have any political aspirations. So, Brad, <laughs> what would you tell that person? How much income could they safely take from a million dollar asset base without risking running out of money? Well, at the risk of being uh, out there dancing with Greg. Um, oh, no, <laughs> not again. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. You know, it's really, it really, I sit down on a case by case basis and figure out travel expenses. Mm -hmm. And I think the main thing is I get people to zero in on what they're going to be spending their money on and get a realistic expectation. And I agree with with Greg on the on the go go the, you know the slow go and the and the no go mm -hmm. because that happens. Although when you get in the no go, your health ex your health expenses tend to be a lot more. So you got to plan for that. Mm -hmm. But if I really pushed you, you know, now I know in Alabama you have very very strong gun laws. So I know nobody owns a gun in Alabama. Okay, but let's say I snuck one in over the state border, and I put a gun to your head and said, I've got a million dollars. I want to be invested perfectly for income. You need to tell me what is the maximum amount of income I can conservatively take from that. What would you tell me? I would say no more than 
I mean, if you made put a gun to my head, I would say no more than four percent. Just okay. That's now, just now, Greg. I know the gun laws are, are are also real tough in Tulsa, where nobody there has any guns of any sort. What number would you give me if I put if I put that gun to your head? Well, based upon income, I could stretch that a little bit if they're depending on what their investments are producing as far as income. And I'm not worrying about mm -hmm. reverse dollar cost averaging. And I could I could go a little bit. I could maybe bump that to five, maybe. You bump it to five. Okay, we have four. We have five. Do we hear five and a half? Five and a half. Five and a half. Going once, going twice. I'm just kidding. We need to take a commercial break right now. When we come back. We're to talk more about how to allocate someone's money when you have the uncertainty of an uncertain time horizon, like a professional athlete. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more from the income generation. If you're near or in retirement, head over to the incomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those be born before 1966. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. Now let's bring back our Financial Advisor Roundtable. Today we have Brad Williams, owner and president of Brad Williams Financial Services. We also have Greg Milia, CEO of Milia Advisory Group, soon to be governor of Oklahoma. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for sticking around. Um, so, of course, asset allocation is what it's all about, and everybody always asks about how I should be allocated. And as you heard, our previous guest, Adam Vega, kind of surprised me because he said that a lot of athletes are more conservative than I think. You know, I always thought athletes were going to be real aggressive in terms of how they want to allocate their money. And he said most are conservative because they understand the risks. So I asked him, gee, if I were a pro, pro athlete in my mid-20s, and as you heard, and I went in there and said, you know, gee, I'm conservative, how would you allocate me? He actually said he'd probably have a 60-40 balanced portfolio, which if you think about it, is really conservative having 60% only in equities if you're in your mid-20s. But of course, that's because athletes typically don't retire at 65. So let's take that now to this income generation member, the one that you want to have so that they're perfectly allocated for income so they can get the 4 or 5% income flow from an asset base. How do you tell them they need to be allocated in order to have uh, the income that they need? Greg? Okay. Um, being governor here, just to make sure you're talking to me, um, <laughs> I... Uh, it, again, on the person, you know, we, we sit somebody down, we bring them through a process where they actually, we go through the, the pros and cons of each holding and get feedback from them as far as what their risk tolerance, what they feel comfortable with, you know, with the different pros and cons of different holdings. And, and then based upon that, we'll allocate to those assets. And then that also, you know, depends on the income we can be generated from those assets as well. Of course. But again, if we take uh, your political aspirations out of the picture, and I said, you know, what is the maximum amount that somebody should probably have in the stock market if they're trying to get more income from their portfolio, push that 4 or 5% we talked about? And what would you tell them? What is that maximum percentage that, as a rule of thumb, somebody should have in the markets given that goal? Well, and are you referring to somebody in their 60s, somebody's prior, prior, prior to retirement, right, at, right, knocking at retirement's door? Somebody's pretty close to retirement are retired. Our income generation members, Greg. You know, most of the people that come to me really are, are afraid of the market because, you know, here we, you know, they look at the debt the government's, you know, uh, is holding. They're they're actually fairly concerned about the market, and they're not interested in a whole lot. I really, you know, generally speaking, not more than 20 percent at most. Okay, 20 percent. Brad, with no political aspirations uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, how would you answer that question? I'm right there with Greg, 20 to 30 percent, because the people I'm talking to, although you know they've enjoyed this this run up, they understand that they're you know that the, the, the uh, party's going to be over, and when the music stops, they don't want to be left without a chair. So uh, you know, looking at, at getting more conservative in that 20 to 30 percent range is is what I would recommend. So Brad, that's easy when you know somebody's retired or going to be retiring in 10 years. You have the time horizon there. But what if it uh, with somebody like a professional athlete where you weren't sure what their time horizon is, it could be 20 years, it could be less, then how do you allocate that kind of person with more of an uncertain time horizon? The person who says, hey, I'm 55, I want to work till I'm 75 or 80, but you, you know as an advisor that they may not be able to. How would you allocate that person? How would it change your decision? Well, you know, I'd look at the resources they have, what guaranteed sources of income they're going to have, and, and you know, I'd 
I, I tend to be more conservative, so that's the route I would go. You, you can't take, uh, especially when you're buying into the top of a market like we are now, um, you don't want the next 10 years to be spent recovering. So being, being a much more conservative would be my line. Okay. Greg, how about yourself? How would you respond to that? Exactly what he said. <laughs> How's that for a response? All right. That's I great. We get a non-political <laughs> response from Mr. Greg Milia from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I love it. it so you no, air to the conservative side down. because you don't know. I, I actually agree. I do actually agree with what Brad said. We're really... You know, when you look at the the P ratios, the market being as as high as they are, buying in right now, you've got to be. It's pretty daunting. So even if somebody's younger, I would I would want them to be really careful at this point and maybe watch this for a little bit more and see if we don't get that, you know, some form of significant correction and look and look at that point because it just it's so expensive at this point. Okay. All right. Well, I think that that makes sense. You know, Brad. So tell me. You know, we we talked about how we get people focused on you know, being conservative, but how do you talk somebody into that? When they come to you and they want to be aggressive, you know, in 30 seconds or less in this segment, tell us what, you know, how do you convince them that maybe it's not in their best interest to be that aggressive if they're that close to retirement? Well, I use a, a pretty much the same approach. I, you know, draw a pyramid out. I do the safe, the moderate, the risk investments, talk about the rule of 100 and their age out of 100 and where they ought to be. And then I look at, uh, you know where we are in the market and what kind of income they're going to need and and that's going to tell them a lot right there and mm -hmm. you know, we talk about what happens when you have a downturn and look at what it takes to recover over a period of time for any percentage of a downturn and that usually opens them up to uh to taking a different more conservative look at it. when we come back in the break we're going to talk about how important it is to have your clients involved in their own finances not just blindly delegate everything so you're watching the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. Stick with us. We'll be back with more from our Financial Advisor Roundtable. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. Let's bring back our Financial Advisors Roundtable. Today we have Brad Williams, owner and president of Brad Williams Financial Services. And we have Greg Millia, CEO of Millia Advisory Group. Gentlemen, thanks again for sticking around. Welcome. You know, you said at the end, Brad, that you take time to educate people. But, you know, what do you do if people don't want to be involved? One of the, the issues that I talked about with Adam was the fact that a lot of professional athletes really just want to, they want to play their sport, they want to give him the money and say, here, you just manage it. You know, but in order to educate somebody, they've got to want to learn. You've got to, they've got to want to invest time in their own finances. So what do you do when you find somebody who just has that, you deal with it, you're the expert, I don't want to know attitude. How do you, how do you overcome that, Brad? Well, I think it's, a, it's getting them involved in the process and, and having a process that they can follow along with you and, and really get them to take ownership of what they're doing. I, you know, I deal with a lot of engineers being in the environment I'm in, the high-tech environment. What I find a lot of time is, is women, you know, they may, uh, if, if the, you know, the engineer's the male, he tends to be dominant and taken over, and and I really try to draw them out to make them understand that there will come a day, most likely when he's gone, mm -hmm. and they need to understand this stuff, and uh, not become a victim at that point. So, you know, it's really about asking the right questions to draw them out to to bring their interest into the into the process. Sure, sure, okay. Of course, we all know that that dominant male engineer, when he gets home, she tells him who's really boss, right? So, uh, <laughs> so we know what happens. Greg, how do you get people to take a bigger interest in their own financial picture so that you can educate them? Well, along the same lines, you know, one of the things I speak frequently about how the buy and hold thinking that's been so pervasive for the last few many years is something that kind of teaches people to be just naive, just, you know, just ignore everything, just stay the course and hold on. Mm. So they kind of start with that philosophy, and it's something I kind of attack from the very beginning. And I, I talk to them about fee structures. You know, often so many people walk in with fee structures are significantly higher than they realize, and just because they ignored it, never took the time to involve themselves. And start poking around at fee structure and showing them how one of the things today is the night in the naivety that if you you know if you're in your i i, I always say the go, go years are the most precious of the time we've got in, in our life and we save all our years to get to that point not to have bills no responsibilities 
and you're just buy and hold, and you're at retirement, and all of a sudden the market drops, and you, you come to the realization that you can't take any money out without destroying principal, just because you're naive and just letting somebody else handle it, it is a very dangerous thing to do. And I show that and explain that to them, and that tends to pique their interest. It's interesting you say the uh, the you know Wall Street and basically the financial world leads people to believe buy and hold is the way to go, and most people don't realize the issue is that. It, it buy and hold really benefits Wall Street. It benefits money managers because yeah. they can't be charging yeah. fees and commissions, you know, if you're getting in and out of things. So I think that's a that's a really, really good point. Gentlemen, if I can get you to stick around just one more time, we need to take another commercial break. And when we come back, we're gonna have more from our financial advisor round table. You're watching the income generation. Welcome back to the Income Generation. Let's bring back our financial advisor roundtable one last time. Today we have Brad Williams from Huntsville, Alabama, and Greg Millia, CEO of Millia Advisor Group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Gentlemen, you know, we, we talked at the end very briefly. You, you mentioned, Greg, about the issues with how people are taught to buy and hold, how we're almost taught to take a very passive role. In, in 30 seconds or 45 seconds or so, can you tell our Income Generation viewers how you help break them of that passive habit to get them to actually take a more active participation role in their money. It's simply give them a process where we show them, well, first show them, like we talked about a minute ago, how dangerous it is just to buy and hold. I, I show them that the buy and hold is an old wisdom. If you go ask the generation of 29 to 54, it lost 93%, took 20 some years to get it back. And if they just bought and hold through that, would they do that again? And they absolutely would not. It's incredibly destructive. Yeah. Great, great answer. Brad, how do you handle that when somebody when somebody thinks, I've read Money Magazine, I've read all the financial literature, and it all says just buy and hold, so that's what I'm going to do? Well, coming from the high-tech city of Huntsville, you know, I, I equate it to flying a lot. You know, I look at, and, and you can appreciate this being a pilot, uh, so, you know, if you're flying from, from Birmingham, from Huntsville to Birmingham, and you're one degree off, you're no big deal, but if you're flying to Beijing, it is a big deal. So you need to make the subtle course corrections along the way that your GPS does, and that's what a good advisor does, is, is helps you navigate those storms and make sure you stay on track, but it takes those subtle course corrections, not the big ones. Good point, very good point. And the person's not liable to notice those own slight deviations on, on their own, and sometimes just making small corrections helps get people to the path much more, much more quickly. So, Brad, Greg, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Brad. In fact, I'd like to take a minute to thank all my guests for joining us for another episode of The Income Generation. I'd also like to thank you, our new and returning viewers. You know, a lot of times we think of celebrities, whether they're athletes or movie stars, almost as a separate race of people. We don't consider that the same problems that can affect us whether it's a sudden illness, a family tragedy, or financial ruin, are the same things that affect them as well. But they can and do, regardless of their fame or the size of their fortune, and some of the same mistakes and oversights that put them at risk can put us at risk as well. We may not have all their mega millions, but whatever we do have represents our future, and that is worth protecting. Thanks for watching. If you're close to retirement and you really, really want to know how to protect and maximize your money, it's absolutely essential that you stay informed and up to date. And right here is where you can do it on the income generation. I'm David Scranton, and thanks again. We'll see you next week. If you're not using someone who's well-trained in fixed income and you're born before 1966, it may just be time for you to break up with that advisor and move on. I would suggest someone who will care for you through these important years of your life. If you need help finding someone, call or write us. I'd also like to remind you of the special report entitled The Income Generation. This is available free to you, our loyal viewers, online. If you haven't downloaded your report, pick it up after the show. If you're near or in retirement, head over to the IncomeGeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those born before 1966. 
I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation.